Welcome to Second Opinion, the reviews show here on the Nexus. I'm your host, Ian Arbuck, and today I will be joined by Mike Sandberg so we can share our experiences with Star Wars The Last Jedi. Find the show notes for this episode at thenexus.tv slash SO34. As with all of the other reviews that we do of movies and TV shows and such, we always split these episodes into spoiler-free at the beginning, and then we will warn you before we get into spoiler territory, so don't worry too much about that until you hear us giving you that warning. Hey, Mike. Hey, Ian. How is it going? It's going pretty well. It's, uh, it's been a good December, I think. Well, good for one reason, at least. We had a new Star Wars movie. <laughs> yeah, it's a recurring thing now, December Star Wars movies. Yep, yep, yep. That's um, I can always kind of tell the time of the year by uh, what we're reviewing on Second Opinion at any given time, you know? September is when the new phones come, and and then December is when we've got a new, new Star Wars movie. Yep. So you just review everything on this channel? Pretty much, yeah. We're, we're not limited to just one type of media or hardware or whatever. It's uh, We're, we're kind of all over the place. Well, that's, that's good. Mm-hmm. So before we start, I think it'll be useful if we kind of share what our past experiences with the Star Wars franchise has been, because that's that's a really big factor that kind of colors, you know, what how people come into a movie. So Mike, what's your what's your past? Well, I obviously I'm old enough to watch the original trilogy first as a kid and I remember it fondly. Watching it on VHS and then watching yeah. it on DVD and then seeing the restored versions with the added added uh extra scenes. <laughs> right. And then and changing Anakin at the end of episode six <laughs> yeah. into young Anakin. And I was young enough to be super excited about the phantom menace and Mm -hmm. as a kid the phantom menace is amazing and uh as i grew older uh the phantom menace kind of uh, i started seeing the cracks and the yeah in it so i'm definitely an old trilogy guy and uh i don't really put much stake in the prequel trilogy that much i don't think Mm -hmm. yeah i was um I think I was in like kindergarten or first grade when uh, when the Phantom Menace first came out, which means that I was also like perfect age for starting to play with Legos right when they started coming out with Star Wars Legos. So like for much of my childhood, that was my interaction with the franchise was, uh, yeah, watching the movies and then like my brothers and I playing with Legos and making up our own stories in the universe. I remember my mom getting me the VH- VHS copy of the Phantom Menace when it first came out. Mm -hmm. And I was so excited to watch it that when my parents went to sleep, I snuck in and grabbed the VHS tape and started watching it. And I got caught red handed and it was banned for like a month. Oh, man. I also was into the uh, the expanded universe quite a bit. I started reading like the Thrawn trilogy when I was in like probably junior high or early high school. And from there, I got into a lot of other like Star Wars novels. Never really did the comic books, but mostly, yeah, the novels that were published by Del Rey and had kind of a a nice cohesive universe set up. Don't don't you feel slighted that they just kind of said these aren't canon? Uh, Oh yeah, they don't count anymore. You wasted you wasted your childhood. Yeah, I I feel like somebody who like spent their entire college career like studying a particular ancient civilization and then like you know right when i was graduating you know some discovery was made that like nullified everything that i knew that i thought that i knew about you know (laughs) or or when they said pluto is no longer a planet (laughs) it's like that yeah exactly exactly your hopes are dashed so so yeah so like kind of re relearning a lot of the rules in this in this universe has been hard for me over the last couple of years like like two years ago when the force awakens came out one of the things that i complained about the most was like they were treating hyperspace very very differently than how i was used to hyperspace being treated you know like they were able to communicate with the base from where they were in hyperspace uh you know and like the millennium falcon was able to stay in hyperspace until it was like within the atmosphere of the planet they're going to and i was like this isn't 
that that's not how it works, you know? Yeah, I remember they had to gear back on the hyperspace travel before they got to the planet. You can't just fly into the atmosphere. Right. In yeah. Hyperspace. And yeah, you're yeah, right. So it's kinda they're kinda trying to make it a little bit more exciting, less nerdy, I guess. Yeah. Or or I guess they were coming up with like ways to solve the problem that they had presented the characters with, you know? And and like didn't worry too much about breaking the the rules of physics that they had established in previous like expanded universe stuff i think they're just uh, they're turning into more of a mass audience type of thing where Mm -hmm. they they don't care as much about like oh we're gonna hurt some feelings of like super fans like they know the super fans are probably gonna still see it regardless so they're like they're like uh we'll give you leeway here and there in the (laughs) storytelling it doesn't matter yeah, kind of like yeah. how the X Men franchise always changes up the rules every every movie. So, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, and that's yeah, that's one of the reasons that like I kind of stopped watching Doctor Who is because I was just like I I didn't know how to deal with like you know what was going to happen because like nothing ever was consistent. There were other reasons that I stopped watching as well, but you know, in in a sense though. Isn't it nice to give creative freedom to directors? Like they can't, I guess there's some consistencies that you have to kind of stick with, but in yeah. other, and, but you also have to give the directors and people making the film a little bit of leeway to tell their story without handcuffing them too much. But in a sense, it can go both ways. I can see right. the argument working both ways. And uh, yeah, I see your plot. I see your plight. Later on, when we get into the spoiler section, I'll talk about uh, one particular example in this movie that I don't think is really like a super obscure nitpicky thing. But, I, you know, because when I was watching the movie, I was like, this is such a trivial problem. Like, I know how they can solve this right now. <laughs> but yeah, so we're not getting into that quite yet because we're still in the spoiler free section. So how how did you... What did you think of this movie kind of initially? Like, how did you feel walking out of the theater? Well, I uh, to me when I first got into the film and it, it opened up at the opening like uh scene really mm-hmm. like it started off with kind of a very cringe e moment and uh forced humor and it I I almost got turned off immediately just in the very first scene. Mm-hmm. And it took me almost half the movie or more to get one back a little bit so I could enjoy it. Mm-hmm. If, if, and uh, I guess when I left the film, I wanted to say I disliked it, uh, but I didn't want to have such a rash opinion right off the bat. I wanted to think about it a little bit more and mm-hmm. I wanted to research more on certain aspects of what I didn't like and see why they put it in there or why they did what they did. So my first impressions were... I enjoyed it, but it didn't live up to expectations. Mm. Yeah, I um, yeah. What you said about about the sense of humor, like the kind of turning you off. Yeah, I found I thought that there were a few jokes in there that didn't really fit with like kind of the the gravitas of what the film kind of felt like it should have been for me. So yeah, there there were a few times where I kind of like sat back in my chair and I was like, well, that was that seemed out of place, you know. But then again, Uh, that's the, yeah, I had the complaints about the misplaced humor, mm -hmm. but what kind of won me back a little bit was this was probably one of the most beautifully shot Star Wars movies. Yeah. Um, You could just tell just the way they shot the scenes, the way they presented like the characters, the way they built the sets. It was, it was one of the most visually appealing Star Wars movies. Yeah, I felt like it was like more refined than The Force Awakens in terms of like the the crazy camera movements and, you know, like the the special effects weren't as over the top, you know, we don't have all these particle effects like flying around and just trying to distract the viewer. But of course, it's, you know, it's it's still like visually stunning because of the quality of of the special effects. It's just more refined. Yeah, and I I I heard about this in, in- I listened to another podcast and they were talking about kind of some of the scenes and mm-hmm. 
just the I know I know I said I didn't like the the opening scene almost immediately just because of the misplaced humor, but right. they did a really good job with shooting that scene in that they didn't have a lot of dialogue in certain aspects of it, but they mm-hmm. but you felt a deep connection to the character involved in that scene, and that was done just by you know, the film angles and just by the visuals. And mm-hmm. that takes a very skilled, competent director to even accomplish something like that. So this might be one of the most talented directors to ever make a Star Wars movie, but there's aspects of the movie where he took liberties where I'm still torn about. Mm-hmm. Who was the director on this one? Isn't his name mm-hmm. Ryan Johnson? I'm not sure. He's he's a fellow, he started off with smaller films he did i'm not sure if you've seen it before but he did brick and brick was like a very low budget film it was like a high school drama slash heist movie Mm -hmm. and it was based off of a shakespeare story and he repurposed it into a movie and then he made looper Mm -hmm. and i think he made one other movie but i can't think of it off the top of my head but he is He's not a super well-known uh, director, but he's done a lot of well-regarded things. Right. Google's also listing the Brothers Bloom. Yeah, that's kind of like a quirky comedy slash action slash heist movie as well. Mm-hmm. But yeah, he's yeah he's one of my favorite. He was one of my favorite up-and-coming directors, and I was I was excited to see this movie just based off of his previous work and just what he brought to the table. Nice. Yeah. So one of the things that I was pretty distracted with during The Force Awakens was how in your face it was about using parallels to like the original trilogy, you know, because like we we had we're on a desert planet and then we have to protect this astromech droid, you know, because it's got like the vital information we escape on the one, you know, it was kind of like beat for beat exactly the same as as episode four. Isn't that kind of wasn't that kind of purposeful though? Because I'm they, sure it was. They didn't yeah, want to remake didn't like the original Star Wars <laughs> movies, but they also didn't want to deviate too much from the formula. So I I feel like right. that was just designed to like get people back in because they feel like they lost so many people with the prequel trilogy. Yeah. Sorry. Get, yeah. Finish finish your thoughts. Sorry. But yeah. So like I feel like this movie, The Last Jedi, kind of I think it took that concept of taking parallels from the original trilogy. But they didn't do it in a way that detracted from it, right? You know, because it, it wasn't it wasn't like step by step. This is what was happening in the story during Episode Five. Therefore, we're going to have that happen here in Episode Eight as well. It was more like kind of thematic things, right? So like, we're it's it's going to be the low point in the trilogy, right? Because it's the middle one where we've got the party split up. One person is off like learning Jedi stuff. The rest of the party is like dealing with like mundane problems uh you know of of military matters and whatnot we do we do end up with a couple of like locations that feel very very familiar you know we we end up on like a white plant a planet with a bunch of like white powder uh we've got trench warfare we've got giant imperial walkers right you know where we uh we end up with some characters in a very like high class you know place kind of like uh cloud city a casino um, where, where they used a bunch of uh games that look made up but then they're like well we have to use a game that you guys all know so (laughs) yeah (laughs) we'll include that as well (laughs) and so yeah the like the more that i think about it the more i see how many parallels there were but like when i was watching the movie it wasn't distracting yeah not too distracting yeah i get i get (laughs) what you're saying yeah i feel like this is somewhat different than the previous films and would you say it feels more like the original trilogy or more like uh the prequels or is it its own beast altogether? Cause I feel like it's a mix of both. I think it's definitely more, definitely more original trilogy. Cause like one of the things that I think held back the prequels by so much was that they got kind of bogged down in the weeds of like galactic politics a bunch. And that's, that's something that they have, stuff. they have stepped way, way back from that. You know, I almost wish they would have, actually included some backstory Mm -hmm. because there's a huge gap well not a huge huge gap but there's a decent 30 or 
40 years gap yeah. between the, the original trilogy and this movie. And we still know almost zero, <laughs> almost zero information of what happened between yeah. then and now. And I'm sure they explained it in the books that have come out. Yep. Yep. And my brother's been reading those. I've picked up one or two, but like, uh, I haven't, I, I don't read novels nearly as much as I used to when I was in high school. So yeah, what I've been able to kind of piece together is that like the new Republic kind of had like, they, they, they wanted to avoid all of the problems of that. The old Republic led into the empire, you know? So they, they don't have like a military uh, really of any description. They're very decentralized. The, the, the federal government there is very, very weak. And so when the first order starts like building strength out on the outer, outer rim or whatever, you know, certain influential people like Leia, like became very concerned by this because they were like, this is an imminent threat. And so they went and formed the resistance. So the resistance is actually not like officially a part of the new Republic, but is like kind of secretly supported by some people who are in the new Republic kind of thing. So there's the new order. Yep. The The first order. The first order. Sorry. There's the first order, the Uh resistance and the new Republic, but the new Republic is almost never, ever mentioned at all. Right. Right. Yeah, and and the only thing that we really see of the New Republic in either of these two movies is the capitals uh, being blown up by the Star Killer base. That's the planet that that they shoot at during the Force Awakens. The implication there is that like the New Republic fleet is now like crippled because like apparently all of their ships were orbiting this one planet, and you know all of them got blown up. Um, and so now, like, the resistance group that we see in the movies, you know, which has been whittled down to, like, a, a little ragtag crew, is the only thing that's standing against the First Order. Okay, so there's, like, three players in the game, kind of, but th- th- this mo- these, I guess these first two movies in this new trilogy aren't really covering the New Republic that much. No. And somehow the, the First Order has a bunch of New Republic, like crafts and uh tie fighters and such like i don't don't know i guess they kind of explain that a little bit in this movie how they get their vehicles and weapons oh yeah so that was kind of shown a little bit what what is what is that phrase the uh the industrial military complex or whatever yeah yeah i thought that was kind of interesting they even had something like that in a star wars movie it's kind of (laughs) kind of like uh modern times a little bit like the issues we have currently yeah, it's kind of neat they included something like that. And I don't know mm-hmm. if that's really a spoiler, but yeah, there's a, a group that the rich group that goes to this casino that's in the movie, uh, they, they're they like weapons suppliers, kind of how uh, in modern times, a lot of American companies are weapons suppliers to pretty much anybody who will buy the weapons. So, yeah. And I think it kind of fits because if you think about it, like the military industrial complex is a concept that really came into the limelight in like the mid 20th century right and since so much of the warfare in the star wars original trilogy was like inspired by world war ii you know especially like the aerial dogfights and stuff like that right yeah i guess i guess that kind of makes some amount of sense for for that to be uh kind of you know something that's brought up as well yeah and I found it really interesting just that Star Wars is making a little bit of social commentary and it makes sense within the plot of the movie as well. So Mm -hmm. I kind of find it interesting that they included stuff like that in this one. And I feel like this one is making more social commentaries than previous Star Wars movies have. Yeah, possibly with like the exception of Rogue One. uh, There was a a lot of people who, you know, drew a lot of a lot of parallels between resistance and you know oh our our candidate didn't get uh, elected for president so yeah and those are both happening like at the exact same time yeah that's very true and uh I'm, i think that might have been a little bit of a coincidence but oh, uh yeah. <laughs> it definitely well, being that the, definitely the movie was already finished by the time the uh you know <laughs> the election happened so but it was it just felt very current and these pre mm-hmm. these last two star wars movies have felt very current and and kind of fresh in a way. Yeah. Like it's not like it's not repeating 
the same thing over and over. I feel like this one actually introduced some new content to digest and like, I guess, research because like you said, the force awakens didn't really introduce much new concepts at all. And yeah. this one, and people complain that the force awakens was too much like the original trilogy, like beat for beat. And then the big complaint about this one is it's too unique. It tries to be too different. So uh, they can't win, I guess. Yeah. And it's, it's, yeah, it was a very, very differently structured movie in terms of like, especially I, it's, it's the longest Star Wars movie that we've had so far. But I think that within the movie itself, it covers like a whole 16 hours or something in universe. Right. Yeah. Which, which is very unusual. And I, I, it, it, you felt every bit of that. Honestly, I, I, I do think it was a little bit over long. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to lie. I got a little bit sleepy in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> I might have closed my eyes for two or three minutes, but yeah, it, it definitely had a little bit of pacing issues as far as like there were some plot details that could have been left out, and I think it would have been the movie would have been better for it. But yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the most controversial things in the movie uh, are the porgs. These little like. They look like a cross between like a barn owl and like with a hamster face or something like that. And and one of my friends after I watched the movie asked me like, "So, are they more Jar Jar or Ewoks?" Which I think is a perfect way of like <laughs> phrasing this question. Yeah. I I think they fall in the middle. Honestly, they're not like they're not as in your face as Jar Jar was. Yeah. But they yeah. also don't have like a lovable nature as the Ewoks do. They're not like mm -hmm. super cuddly. They they are a little bit. Uh, they, I ju they're just annoying nature, annoying nature element. Basically, what I would <laughs> call them. Yeah. And they're obviously placed there. They're it stands out because they're obviously there to sell toys. Right. <laughs> I'm like uh, they're on a certain island in the movie and. I guess it's part of the natural habitat, but I, I just don't buy. <laughs> I just don't buy that those are the creatures that are on the island, and that's their natural uh, yeah. way of things. And and like I think it seemed to me very unnecessary that that the porgs stay in the movie after they left the island. You know what I mean? Yeah, they they <laughs> kind of <laughs> really push the porgs on us, but. I kind of coming. I'm kind of coming to the realization that, I, sure, I want this dark Star Wars, dark and gritty Star Wars movie, mm -hmm. but Star Wars is something that's I think now for everyone, and yeah. you want to be able yeah. to share this with your kids. You want to be able to share this with your parents and your friends. And sure, annoying characters like that <laughs> can take you out of it a little bit, but then it. It's not as egregious as one might think. I I, I can right. I can forgive it just so that the kids have something they can latch on to a little bit. So they were at that line of if they were in there anymore, I probably would have thrown a fit. Yeah. One thing that I was going to say about Jar Jar just now is that I think his, the biggest weakness was that they kind of shoehorned him into being like a plot point as well, you know? He was the one who could solve a few particular problems for that, you know, for the group. So, like, it was good that they kept him around. But then I would also say that that's probably the biggest strength for the Ewoks, right? Yeah, they served <laughs> plot. They served uh, actual plot. They they yeah. uh, d helped defeat the Empire... ATS but the and but the porgs never do. The, the porgs, porgs are just there. squat. They're just there. Yeah. They don't. If they weren't in there, the the plot wouldn't have changed at all. Mm -hmm. They're just, I guess, ornaments. <laughs> yeah, they're ornaments. They're they're needless, but I understand why they're there. Unfortunately, there were a couple of like little physics things that I uh, that I was distracted by in this movie. Um, for one thing, the the cinematographer seems to think that there is such a thing as down in space, right? <laughs> yeah, even though it did, uh, you're talking about the bomber scene. 
Yeah, so when they get shot down, they list downwards in relation to the camera, which, like, okay, yes, that's possible. It's totally possible for that to happen, but it's not necessarily, you know, that's not the direction that they would be going necessarily. <laughs> yeah, I I think Star Wars is kind of, I, I don't think physics really applies to much of <laughs> Star Wars. There's sound in space. Uh, That's true, yeah. There, nothing that we think of as space is actually space in Star Wars. So it, it was pretty egregious. What, like what It's like not mean? like easy to overlook. <laughs> it's not easy to overlook at all, but it made for a cool looking scene. And I think that's what they're going mm. for. But yeah, I get your point, And I think it's I, I think they could have left it out or figured out a better way of doing it. And that one, that one actually, like, I was kind of okay with that. I understood, you know, okay, we're ju- they're, they're, they're just giving us a clear visual indication that, like, this ship is going down, right? The, the one thing that I couldn't get past was when the First Order was shooting at, their, at the uh, Resistance fleet from, like, really long range. We got to see these big turbo lasers arcing. Yeah, down. are, like, are, you, you, know, are you talking about like how when you shoot a bullet, the bullet drops over time? Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, light that doesn't do that. That didn't make any sense. <laughs> no, I, and I actually didn't even notice that until you mentioned it. But yeah, I think most people didn't notice it. But yeah, the, if, like if there's no there, there's, there's no, no reason for it. reason for that to happen, no. and also lasers don't obey those laws of like gravity pulling them. You know, light just keeps going. <laughs> And and keeps going until it hits a solid object. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and that yeah. So that's the one that really bugged me. <laughs> yeah, I, I I completely see how that would bug you, but I, it doesn't ruin it though for you, does it? It broke the immersion for me. Yeah, and speaking of broken immersion, when there's a serious scene, the movie kept like hammering in the comedy, and mm, mm-hmm. and my immersion was broken. The very first second of the movie, the movie opens up with what I would like to say is a lot like space balls. There's like a Mm. scene in the opening where um, this is not really a spoiler, I I don't think. Um, Poe flies in on a spacecraft and radios into the Star Destroyer and basically distracts General Hux. He distracts General Hux by the old, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Could you repeat that? I'm sorry yeah. I didn't hear you could repeat that. And it was dumb, it was played up so over the top and so comedically that you, it almost felt like it was taken right out of the space balls or something like that. And that scene alone, I, I feel like that was not a good way to start a movie because immediately you're because the first scene is supposed to set the tone of the movie, and the movie is yeah. not that comedy. It's not a comedy at all. And most of the movie's quite serious, and the opening scene does not set that table up very well at all. And they kind of did that same thing in The Force Awakens with Poe again, when, you know, he gets captured and he's he's plopped down in front of Kylo Ren, you know, and his, his first words are like, so how does this work? Like, do I talk? Do you talk? Like, what's going on? <laughs> and, you know, and it's supposed to be like a funny moment. I, th- I think they're really trying to make Poe the new Han Solo. mm yeah, trying to because Han Solo has these epic like quips and like he ha- he just knows what to say and it's always comes off as awesome. Mm-hmm. But Poe he he carries somewhat of the same gravitas, but he's not he doesn't have that sarcastic ability like uh, Harrison Ford does, and it it shows. But he is a, yeah. I, I still think Poe is one of the more likable characters in this new trilogy. But he's he's not Han Solo, and they're trying to make him into Han Solo. Yeah, and I think part of part of the weird thing about it, especially with like the can, can you hear me? I'm on hold, you know, kind of bit, was that he sounded very contemporary. You know, <laughs> yeah. And one of yeah, the one did. of the hallmarks of Star Wars has always been that like they sound like they are from another place. They don't speak like we do. Uh, us contemporary Americans, you know? Yeah, the, and so the that, verbiage sounded very 21st century. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah. That's that's another kind of little thing that kind of eats away at the, at the illusion. And, and it happens quite frequently throughout the movie. And uh, I'm sure we'll discuss some of those scenes in the spoilers because we don't want to yeah. um, ruin that now. But any, any other... 
I think I got one or two other like spoiler free things. Yeah. The the characterization of like Ray and Kylo, I think was very important in this movie, right? Especially for Kylo Ren. Because by the end of The Force Awakens, I was very much just like, he's just a whiny teenager. Like, I don't care about him at all. Yeah, that's everybody's take, basically. <laughs> and and he definitely needed the time in this movie for us to really get a sense of, like, kind of who he is, what his motivations are, you know, and see him develop a little bit. And at first, when they when when I saw that he was getting more screen time in this movie, I was a little bit like... Uh oh! Like, is this just gonna be really annoying? But no, it actually like it built him up in my mind, and I kind of no. uh, I get him a little bit more now. He, he's turned into one of the best villains in the Star Wars franchise in a long time, and mm-hmm. he has a lot of different facets to his character. Like he's he's just not straight up evil. He he right. has a lot of parts of him that you can empathize with, and kind of like say hey uh he might be right on this aspect of it so he's a he's a multi-dimensional character and a lot of times in star wars multi-dimensional characters don't usually happen very often right (laughs) especially even even if i can call exactly what he's going to be doing before he does it (laughs) well yeah but yeah because he does have a somewhat of established character but yeah, and kind of a, a one-track mind, uh, <laughs> I would say. I definitely feel like he grew in this movie, and he became less of a whiny character and more of a character you would like uh, sort of empathize with at times. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Uh, Ray, I, I think Ray, I, I didn't really think she changed that much. I, I, I think they could have done a little bit more with her, but... yeah. Yeah, I would probably say that she kind of had the opposite treatment than than Kylo did, right? Like, she was way less predictable in this movie. Like, she was doing a lot of stuff that I wasn't expecting her to do, but we didn't get to know her a whole lot more than we than we did yeah. in the first movie. And- Which is okay, because, like, the first movie focused on her so much that we we didn't really need that. Yeah, that's, that's true. And I, I feel like some of the... One of the new characters, I think, was pretty likable. Mm-hmm. um rose yeah the uh she, is she uh t- taiwanese or i don't know um in terms of like the actress yeah i have no idea yes Br- rose she was like one of the new characters and um i i definitely she was she was almost instantly likable she had a very likable personality and she had good chemistry with uh who, who was she with the most of the movie she was with uh she was with finn Finn, Finn. I always forget his name. And I think Finn was probably the most wasted of characters this this uh, movie. Mm. I feel like he was in the side plot that didn't really matter at all, really. Yeah, that was... Yeah. <laughs> the, the, yeah, the side plot was uh, a little little weird for me we can get a little bit more into that later so i, I just looked her up she is vietnamese vietnamese. Um, v- vietnamese american yep and she tied in immediately with the character in the bomber in the middle in the beginning of the movie where it's yeah. we were alluding to and that's that that part um they did a really good job shooting because uh even though the character in the bomber didn't say a word you could tell just by visualization that they were related to each other just they're both wearing the same uh, necklace and uh, yep, yeah. So I thought it was really done well as far as sto- sto- visual storytelling without having to tell you, hey, I-, I hate it when movies explain things to you. I think right, you should be able to figure it out yourself as you watch. Rose's character also brings up the subject of inclusion, which is, a, is something that Star Wars has been improving on a lot recently. In this movie, I noticed that, yeah, so we, we have an Asian American lead actress who, frankly, like, doesn't really fit into the typical, like, Hollywood, like... Yeah, she's not, you know, like, she's not like a supermodel, like a Hollywood... Yeah, lead actress normally would or like uh, that definition of beauty, like that very strict, like mm-hmm. magazine cover definition of beauty, I guess. But yeah. I still think she's a attractive face and she uh, has a lot of like warmth to her. So, mm-hmm. but yeah, 
I think the reason why we're seeing this change in Star Wars, though, a little bit is our society's changing, but mm-hmm. also box office is more of a global phenomenon now, not just a United States phenomenon. So right. they're trying to get all these diverse uh, characters in there to appeal to a global audience, not just the United States based audience. And we've been seeing this over the years where the shift from amount of money made in America to the amount of money made overseas, it shifted over the years where America is no longer the biggest bucket of where funds come from when they, uh, well, some movies it is, but like World of Warcraft, that movie bombed in America. I think it made less than a hundred million, but it still broke even because overseas it made gangbusters. So I had actually forgotten that they made a World of Warcraft movie. And uh, yeah, that's all you need to know about World of Warcraft. Don't go see it. And and the inclusion goes beyond just like racial inclusion as well. Because I noticed that we had Benicio Del Toro's character, the hacker. He, you know, was... he you know had like a stutter he had kind of like a shiver in his hand a little bit and that was something that like they they didn't like none of the char- other characters ever like called him out on it you know it was never like a plot point it just was right yeah it was just like a quirk that he had or like mm-hmm. i guess he was uh probably born with obviously but um yeah, yeah i guess it's just uh, a way of um making that character more memorable and stick out more i guess mm-hmm So with that, do we want to get into some spoilers? So, yeah, if you have not seen the movie yet and you want to go into it fresh, now would be the time to uh, shut off this review and maybe come back to it after you've watched the movie because we are moving into our spoiler section. I feel like he's kind of a wasted character as well. (laughs) Like, he, yeah, I, I enjoy that actor, Benicio Del Toro. I think he's one of the better actors working right now, but... They kind of wasted his potential a little bit on this movie. They yeah. kind of made him into a, uh, is he on our side? Is he not on our side? Kind of uh, like, uh, what's his name was on? Um, like Lando. Like Lando, yeah. He he reminded me yeah. a little bit like Lando. Like he was in it. Like he he somewhat like liked the, the other characters and he somewhat helped them. But then also he, when it helped him out, he, he uh, stabbed him in the back. Yeah. Well, yeah. So I noticed that the one of the major spoilers in this movie was kind of similar to a major spoiler in the last movie. It was it all boils down to who did Kylo kill this time? Because last time he killed Han Solo, and this time he killed off Snoke, which was like I was very very surprised that they did that. Yeah, that actually did catch me completely off guard because they built Snoke up into this big bad. And Mm -hmm. you're expecting a lot of mythology behind Snoke and like, will we learn where he comes from? Will we we learn how he came to power? How did he? Yeah. But no, he's kind of a red herring. He was kind (laughs) of, he was kind of there to serve as, uh, you know, growth for Kylo Ren. Like he was just there to kind of help grow Kylo Ren as a character. And he served his, (laughs) <laughs> served his point in the plot and he was gone he was more of a plot mm-hmm. piece than anything else yeah and it was it was interesting to see kind of how that that played out very differently than like the darth vader killing the emperor scene you know because they they turned on their masters but for very very different reasons right kylo wasn't doing it to like you know s- save someone who he cared about a lot he did it so that he could take power yeah he did it for power and he basically said paraphrasing here but he said no more sith and no more jedi like i want to do something different i want to do something unique i think the time of jedi and sith are over Mm. and and i think that's something i didn't realize both snoke and kylo ren they're they are not sith no, not directly. No. Yeah. They uh, dabble in the dark side, but just because you dabble in the dark side doesn't necessarily mean that you are practicing. I guess Sith and Jedi are like two different religions almost in the Star Wars realm. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, like, 
if we get into the expanded universe, like the Sith Order has kind of come and gone quite a few times, and a lot of the times that it has come back has been like literally just somebody finding old Sith texts and then going like, "Well, that sounds cool. I want lightning or whatever," uh, you know. <laughs> yeah. So Kylo Ren turning against his master and taking power. I guess that's he him proving that he is not weak. Like he mm-hmm. can stand on his own two feet, and he doesn't have to be because 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 uh didn't it feel like snoke was like manipulating his his uh emotions a lot like i feel like snoke oh, yeah. was really manipulating him and i think he had enough and he was ready to kind of prove himself on his own mm-hmm. the the manipulations that like sith masters do in the star wars movies has always felt really weird to me because like they have to make it so obvious that this is manipulation for the audience you know that i that i'm always like why can't darth vader see like (laughs) why can't he understand what's going on you know like so so obvious like oh you you want this car but it's not yours anymore this guy took it (laughs) like if if somebody tells you give into your hate just say no like just don't do it right Yeah, yeah Yeah, it's quite obvious. And this one wasn't quite as obvious. It, it, I feel like there was more mind control in this movie mm-hmm. than um, in previous. Like there was a lot of mind games and a lot of new force powers or I, I'm kind of a, I know there's they introduced some new force powers sort of, but I kind of am coming to the conclusion that the, the force is growing stronger. Like, because mm. uh, it seems like characters that wouldn't necessarily just dis- you know display force tendencies are like actually like demonstrating force tendencies and, that, and uh to me it feels like it's just be- something with the force is growing stronger in the universe and that's why mm. there's more people like having those tendencies i'm guessing it's an interesting hypothesis Um, because, yeah, we've definitely seen some like feats that we haven't before, you know, like Kylo Ren, like literally stopping lasers in midair with, you know, being able to full body prevent people from moving. That's not something that ever showed up in, in either of the other trilogies. So, yeah, that that does bring up an interesting thing that, of course, as soon as he killed Snoke, right, Snoke's like royal guards, the red, the red people with all the cool the really freaking cool weapons by the way that was that was um, a really well shot scene and uh mm-hmm. snoke's lair man that's that was a beaut to behold oh yeah yeah that was really cool i was just like thinking to myself the whole time though like kylo ren can just like freeze people and not let them move why didn't he just like do that or like choke you know crush all of their windpipes you know, it would have been a very, very quick fight. <laughs> yeah, but I, don't know I why feel like that, do that does take a lot of focus. And in, in the previous movie, when he did that, he was alone with somebody else. Right. And yeah. um, he was able to focus all of his, I guess, strength onto one person. Mm-hmm. And I feel like yeah. with that many people in the room, I, I don't think that would be possible within. I, I guess if he became even more powerful. It, it might be possible, but uh, mm-hmm. I think just the fact that everybody in the room were probably at a little bit force sensitive. Yeah, I, I don't know for sure about those those royal guards. They may have just been like the elite of the elite ninja dudes, but yeah, you we, know, or they could have been yeah some sort of force initiates or something. Yeah, we know um, we have no clue about <laughs> any of the for the structure behind the first order, really. But right, they're they're, right. they're badass. I do realize now that we've we've heard references to like Kylo being the leader of the Knights of Ren and we don't really we still don't know exactly what that means. Who are the Knights of Ren? Yeah, is we that don't like know. is that the little group that he formed after he rebelled against Luke? You know, cuz Luke said that he took half of the half of the, like the students with him uh and then killed the other half. So maybe that's what he called his little little gang. Yeah, the, the, they didn't really specify much. And again, I feel like this was more Star Wars being small instead of broad. Like Star Wars, this movie was focusing more on these individual characters. And you still don't know much about what's going on in the universe at whole. Like, mm-hmm. you know very little. This movie is very, very, like, focused. Yeah. And I think that's a little bit of a detriment. But it also leaves the door wide open for 
spinoffs and uh, that type of thing. And yeah, I don't know which way Ryan Johnson Johnson's going to go with his new trilogy as planned, but uh, he he might do a Knights of Ren uh, trilogy for all we know. And I yeah. Or they might tackle that in some novels or something. Yeah, I could be. I'm not sure if I like that concept of not giving us everything in the movie, so we have to read the novel. Like, I would like a little bit of uh, information, you know. Right. <laughs> you right. Know? So, speaking of like focusing in small, that reminds me of how the the military tactics in this this movie didn't make much sense to me. You know, like w- supposedly the first order has been, you know, taking a lot of power. They they they've covered a lot of ground in the universe, right? Or in the galaxy. And and they're trying to wipe out this this last little bit of resistance, you know. So the resistance fighters are down to just like a handful of ships. But we only ever see a handful of first order ships, you know? But we we, we don't see- know the scope and brevity of what the first order has, and that's that's another exactly. problem. Like that could be all of what the first order has there they might be just as small of an organization as the rebels yeah. for all we know which it which really weirds me out because like they've been talking about like oh the first order there's such this huge threat threat they're going to take over the galaxy and it's like well if they've only got five capital ships here to like spare they, they can't be that much of a threat you know <laughs> yeah it, it, it's definitely that aspect of new star wars is very much wanting mm-hmm and it's not like <laughs> there's not a lot there for you to like chew on as far as like what's going on in the galaxy uh, who controls what yeah it's like a a focused battle basically mm-hmm. you don't know what, what you don't know any like if you just watched a movie about a battle in World War Two and you didn't know anything about Germany or America you right. just knew about the battle that's what Star Wars feels like now. And like when they when they landed on the uh, the planet, you know, and and the uh, resistance have holed themselves up in in this old rebel base, you know, the the first order troops that land is literally like three walkers, three you know look like ATATs with Cylon heads. Yeah, they're they said they're AT sixty twos or something, a new variety, and and one very large gun that will you know blow a hole in the uh, in the the big door that they need to get through but like that's it that's all the forces that they have is like four walkers yeah yeah it seems like a very small maybe maybe they uh only had that in the vicinity and they didn't they didn't explain that really but yeah i feel like it was maybe showing a little bit of how unprepared kylo ren is to lead like he just is (laughs) he is headstrong and he just jumps right in without really knowing what's going on 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 the surface like he just sends these troops down and he doesn't really know the lay of the land he doesn't know anything he just is aggressive and he is doing it out of emotion not out of intelligence i feel like he's very very easy to manipulate on the battlefield right you know like (laughs) as soon as the millennium falcon shows up and shoots down a couple of tie fighters he's like okay all the tie fighters go after that you know instead of like splitting the forces a little bit right like have a few tie fighters chase off the millennium falcon have a few more tie fighters continue to pick off the speeders that are coming towards us you know (laughs) yeah he's not he's not a general (laughs) he's not a general at all (laughs) now i would you would expect that the actual generals would be a little bit better at their jobs as well no the (laughs) they're not (laughs) this the situation that like the writers set up in this movie to give to give like our main character is kind of a a ticking time bomb right like a a set timeline that they have to solve this problem within was kind of contrived like okay we can't just jump away in hyperspace to get away from us uh from the first order because they're tracking us and the first order can't catch up to us right away because our our ships are a little bit faster in sublight right but then it's like why doesn't the first order just send like one or two capital ships do a little hyperspace jump to be in front of the resistance and then there you go they've got nowhere to go you just well, <laughs> i i cuz they can track the sh- i feel like they can track the ships that's another new plot device they Im- implemented is mm-hmm. the ability to track ships in hyperspace they never actually explain it though no they don't <laughs> they just say hey there's this uh, device we got and it can track ships in hyperspace that's all you know. That's all you need to know. But 
I think they can track the ships, but they don't necessarily know the destination of the ship. So maybe that's why right. they couldn't jump ahead and kind of wait for. Well, them. no, I'm not. I'm not saying like jump ahead to where the rebel ships are going to jump to. I'm saying jump ahead into like you know the the next place where they're going to be as they're traveling in sublight speed. You know. Because, like, if you can't catch up to them using your own sublight engines, you can at least catch up to them using hyperspace. Yeah, that's that's true. Yeah. Yeah, it, it was more of a plot device to uh, run this B-plot that they had going on in the movie that ended up being quite the mess of a waste yeah. of time. So the B-plot I'm talking about is in the movie, they introduced this hyperspace tracking beacon just so they could have a side plot of trying to like disarm it so they could escape. Mm -hmm. And they introduced uh, this hacking side character beneath uh, played by Benicio del Toro. And they had to fly down to this uh, planet that had a, I'd call it casino planet or rich, rich, rich people planet, rich people planet with uh, little urchins that live in the stables. Right. (laughs) (laughs) The little poor boys and girls that live in the stables to take care of uh, space horses. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah. And and now that you mention it, like nothing that happened on that planet made any difference. None of it matters. No, it was just it was more of a distraction um, because when all is said and done, it was a trap. And we're back at square one. Yeah. Yeah. We're back at square one again. So it didn't matter at all. And I think maybe they did it to have Finn in the movie a little bit more and the new side character, Mm -hmm. Rose. And then also to kind of paint a lesson for Poe. So Poe was mistrusting of the leadership. And they were all, I guess, they're kind of um, making making it out to be that there was a somebody on the ship that could be like giving away their their mm, place mm-hmm. in the galaxy. And so every, it seemed like the leadership, like uh, Leia and uh, that vice admiral, what's her face? Yeah. It seemed like they were very like coy about what was going to happen next, like what their plans mm-hmm. were. And Poe is like a, a strong headed guy and he just wants to jump in and, you know, do stuff. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, he didn't feel like anything was being done. And so he decided to mutiny the whole ship without knowing all the facts, without knowing anything. And because he did that, he ended up getting a lot of people killed. And it pretty much painted a lesson there for Poe and Mm -hmm. for people watching the movie, I guess. Because, yeah, typically the way that we usually see that kind of plot line going down is the headstrong, like, main character who doesn't respect authority does you know comes up with some crazy plan and it works to save everybody and then it works yeah and that's why that's like the vindication right <laughs> but in this case it wasn't <laughs> and and they had strong female leads leading mm-hmm. the ship and you, you kind of didn't trust them because the movie kind of made it so you didn't want to trust them at first but then it spun it where hey these these ladies they were very confident and they knew exactly what they were doing but maybe they should have uh, divulged a little bit, uh, and they would have. Well, uh, I mean, military need to know, you know, chain of command, et cetera, et cetera. So, <laughs> yeah. so I can understand why they didn't. Yeah, I can understand that. Yeah, yep, yep, yep. So, yeah, I, I feel like that B plot probably could have been left out and shortened the movie down a little bit, and you probably wouldn't have missed it at all. Yeah, no, no, I I wouldn't have missed it. Of course, going into this movie, you know, we're we're very aware of the fact that Carrie Fisher died in real life after they finished filming this movie, you know, but before it came out. And so one of the big questions for me was like, how are they going to deal with that in universe? Are they, you know, I was expecting them to kill her off at some point during the movie in order to avoid having to have her in the next movie, right? And so when they when they blew up the the bridge of the ship where she was, you know, and she goes gets sucked out into space, I was like, oh, that's it. They're killing her off very early in the movie. Yeah, but, yeah, like, I, thought, her I off. thought so as well. Yeah, and and then you know that was a red herring, and I was like, what? 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 Okay. <laughs> and it's kind of ironic because she's the only actor actor from the original trilogy outside of Chewbacca that's that's lived, um, but mm. she's dead in real life. <laughs> Right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and uh, Han Solo and Luke, uh, spoiler, Luke dies in this mm-hmm. movie. 
in a pretty, pretty cool, pretty cool fashion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that that whole Leia thing. Um, how how'd you feel about it? Did you feel like my? I, I kind of thought it was a, uh, pretty dumb at first. I kind of thought it was a ridiculous plot piece, like having her get sucked out and then and then float back, force in. pulling her back. Yeah, but then but then I realized she had the force like it's part of i guess she's always shown that she has some yep. force power in her and i feel like when you when you die or are close to being dead you get like a huge boost of um like adrenaline or adrenaline whatever. so may i think may in my mind i was just picturing that that adrenaline just woke her up and mm-hmm. what gave her like exceptional power but i yeah, thought it was kind of yeah. cool in the end, I don't know. Mm-hmm. I'm torn. And and I and I thought it was very important for that kind of scene to happen because that was Kylo, in, like having the choice of killing both of his parents now, you know. But then he didn't take that. It was one of the other pilots who actually took the shot. So, yeah, that yeah. that was an interesting little twist as well. Kind of, you know, coloring him in a different light. Mm-hmm. Like he's. Mm-hmm not all evil like he still has like some sort of conscience conscience in him that's like telling him hey maybe you shouldn't do this or you have an attachment to your mother at some point in time so yeah yeah what what was your feeling on the end as far as the final battle scene Mm -hmm. when luke shows up yeah that was i I know that a lot of people who saw that like very immediately caught on to the fact that his like his beard looked different his hair looked different the thing that i noticed right away was as as his silhouette is walking down the hallway i was like his ankles look really skinny for some <laughs> reason that was like the thing that i noticed <laughs> you, you um, just uh <laughs> pay attention to the smallest and weirdest of details <laughs> his ankles uh, you know, why why did you not like the 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 last jedi uh his ankles i didn't like how skinny they were <laughs> old man ankles <laughs> that's that's a funny observation that was like oh man that was the coolest force feat that I've, i think we've ever seen uh it was, it was projecting his own image across the galaxy it was a great um, twist too mm-hmm yeah. And like I was, you know, people were like, how do you get into the base? And I was like, OK, that's not like that's the least of our concern. How do you get off the like the other planet? That That's what I was like. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and I actually didn't see that coming. And then in retrospect, uh, he didn't as he was walking on the planet, he didn't leave any footprints. Oh, did they show that? Oh, yeah. He didn't leave any footprints. Uh, I don't think his lightsaber touched the lightsaber of Kylo Ren's as far as I remember. Huh. Okay. Yeah. I will have to pay very close attention. Yeah. I'm attention seeing it again last, tonight. That's why time. I'm kind of pressed for time because I bought tickets for the 815 showing. So, um, yeah. yeah. But, uh, uh it's, it's one of those movies where I feel like it's going to get better the more times you watch it. Whereas mm-hmm. the prequels got worse the more times you watch it. So there's mm-hmm. just a, there's a, even though it's really long, there's a lot thrown at your face and a lot of new things. And it's, mm hmm. I, yeah. I think I'll end up liking it more and more the more times I see it. I think I also liked Yoda in this movie more than I've liked Yoda in any other. Like, because so many of the things that, that like, these wise one-liners that Yoda has had in the past... Yeah. ...have, like, up, upon closer inspection are just complete BS, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, like, the, 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 the one thing that he said in this movie about, like, um, it, you know, it's the curse of, of all masters, of all teachers, that our students will become more than what we are or something like that. And we are what they grow beyond. And I was like, yeah, yeah, that's so perfect. Yeah, yeah he and he was a puppet again, I think. Oh, really? Yeah. Of course. <laughs> or at least he looked like a puppet. Uh, either the special <laughs> effects got a lot better or it was the puppet. But yeah, he was a great addition, and I'm I'm excited to see what other uh, what else they can do in the third movie because this is the, mm-hmm. one of the first Star Wars movies I've, I remember in a long time where it just ends. It feels like the story is over in a way, like mm. it doesn't like give you a crazy teaser at the end, like oh uh, I feel like this was an answer, I feel like that wasn't answered, like it just ends, and you're like, well, it's a good movie, but. Uh, I'm not necessarily super excited for the the next one because they didn't really build up any anticipation of 
what's going to happen. Yet you have no clue where the story's going to go next. And I kind of like that in a way where you're not leaving unfulfilled in a way. Right. Although, like, in the back of your mind, you're still aware of the fact that, like, okay, the Resistance still <laughs> just, like, a little band of people. Now now they all fit on one ship, the Millennium Falcon, together. Yeah, there's, right? like, That's four how... of them. <laughs> <laughs> this, like, this is way, way lower than yeah, the, yeah. Than it's the not even army. Alliance ever got. It's not even an army anymore, guys. It's, it's more mm-hmm. like a group of 50 men and women. Yeah. Uh, um, but they did allude to the fact that they have people in the galaxy that are... Uh, I guess, support their cause. And I think you're going to see a banding together of these smaller tribes of people and aliens in in the next movie. I feel like that's coming, where we're going to see kind of like a combination of armies that are banding together for one cause. So maybe that's something to look forward to in the next one. They did message all those people, and they did have red receipts on, though, and uh, <laughs> nobody responded. Nobody replied. Yeah, <laughs> so maybe they just weren't uh, ready. <laughs> May- <laughs> they weren't ready. They had to go through their uh, political system and uh, do some uh, votes uh-huh. and stuff. So <laughs> that's probably what it was. One other uh, force power. Uh, what What do you think of the ability for them to kind of FaceTime each other? Oh yeah, that was that was very weird, and and I I found it actually kind of gratifying that Kylo was also very confused. He was like, "Wait, can, can you see my surroundings? Because I can't see yours." And you know, like yeah, n- <laughs> they they it didn't seem like they were purposely doing that themselves. No, and and Snoke revealed later that that he, he was, was the, the one, one who had been. doing that, mm-hmm. and that again, like that seems like he Snoke has like maybe some unique power in the Force that other people. Yeah. Don't so maybe we won't see that again in the next films. I don't know, or maybe right. they'll learn to harness it themselves. But that's again showing some of the weird humor in it. Like uh, it's a serious line, and then she's like, "Kylo, put a shirt on." Yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> it was a it was a pretty good moment when she, when she was like, "I'd rather not do this right now," and he was like, "Me neither." And then they cut to like him shirtless, and I was like, "Ah, aha." Uh-huh. That's why. <laughs> yeah, I, I needed the shirtless Kylo in, in my right life. Oh, yeah, no. He looks super weird. <laughs> <laughs> he's got a weird body. <laughs> he's, a, he's a funny guy. Um, Especially I, with, like, the, uh, the like, high-waisted black pants. He's always he wearing high-waisted outfit. pants and everything he's yeah. saying. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he, he wears those high-waisted pants. <laughs> yeah, and other weird things. Uh, the planet that Luke's been uh, living on. Uh, Mm -hmm. that's another weird uh comedy moment is in the end of the force awakens she's handing him his lightsaber oh yeah and then this one they reshot that whole scene and he just grabs the the lightsaber and comedically just tosses it behind his shoulder like ah f it (laughs) i think that was i think that was the most perfect comedic moment you know i didn't know what to do i didn't know what to 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 (laughs) laugh or to like just I mean, it fit perfectly with what we knew of Luke so far that, you know, he had left and was hiding and, you know, didn't want to have anything to do with any of this Jedi crap anymore. So him just tossing the lightsaber aside, I was like, I mean, yeah, like unexpected, but like makes total sense now that I think about it. Everything (laughs) on that, everything on that island was strange. Like the porgs, we mentioned that earlier, Mm -hmm. the weird little people that took care of the island and you don't really know anything out about them except for they get terrorized by Ray the entire time. And that's like some comedic mo- moments that I kind of enjoyed a little bit yep. seeing them. The awkwardness of watching <laughs> Mark Hamill milk a creature yeah, and drink yeah. its green milk while staring but us in the face. I feel like that was <laughs> very much original trilogy humor. Because mm-hmm. in the original trilogy, there's so many like little things where they would like cut open a creature to get in to like warm themselves. Or mm-hmm. th- there's so many little weird things with creatures. And so I felt like that was very Star Warsy to me. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, weird creatures. Definitely. Yeah. So, so I guess uh, we, I need to wrap up here, but yeah, you have anything final? I'm definitely going to have to see the movie at least another one or two times. Like you said, there's a couple of things that I that I didn't uh, take note of the first time. In particular, I'm always looking out for like whether or not they make a uh, 1138 reference, which is kind of one of, one of those Easter eggs that uh, you can keep an eye out for in most Star Wars movies. <laughs> 
I only uh, yeah. mess with Easter eggs on Easter. So Ian, I don't, <laughs> I don't care about that. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> and you're going, you're, you're going out tonight to see it in uh, a special theater with Dolby. What is it called? Dolby Atmos. Yeah, it's Adobe Cinema, um, brand new to mm-hmm. our area. It uh, has the Atmos surround sound, which has speakers all around you. So if it's raining, you can hear the rain coming down in your head. I'm excited. I've never um, seen a movie in this type of uh, theater before. So yeah, I'm all you'll about. You'll definitely have to let us know if it like, yeah. if it significantly alters the, uh, the experience. I, yeah, I will. I'm all about these new exp- theater going experiences. Er- earlier this year, I saw Dunkirk and mm. that movie was actually shot in full IMAX. Have you ever been ah, to, yeah. have you actually ever been to a real IMAX screen? Yes, but only for like big nature documentaries. <laughs> so yeah, uh, all the almost the entirety of Dunkirk was shot in IMAX, and mm. this the movie was floor to ceiling, and it was about thirty percent taller than your standard movie, so you got thirty percent mm-hmm. more screen space. So it was like watching a full screen and wide screen at the same time. So I think full screen and then extend the sides, and that's what IMAX was. So. I'm excited about these new theater experiences and what these directors are doing to keep people in the theaters because we're Mm -hmm. changing to, you know, at home experiences. But yeah, I'll let you know if this uh, Atmos thing is worth the price of admission. Uh, It's almost $20 for a ticket. So have you ever been to an Omni theater? Yeah. uh, The theater near my house is uh, Omni Max, which is just another version of a IMAX and uh, the screens around you almost like yep in a, yep. In a circle. That's yeah, a form so of that's, IMAX, but it's not. That's the one thing that like will always kind of add to the experience, in my opinion, is you know having having the visuals actually wrap around you. Yeah, but I, I'm so. I'm excited what's what's coming down the road because they're gonna have to do new things like that to keep mm-hmm. people going to the theaters. So I'm yep. hoping maybe they'll do something with the next Star Wars movie to make it unique for the theater or mm. Disney just bought Avatar, the company that makes Avatar. So maybe the next Avatar trilogy or quadrilogy or whatever they're doing, that's going to be probably amazing. So I'll keep you updated mm-hmm. on how awesome the Atmos experience is. Nice. Nice. The day after we recorded, Mike messaged me saying that the Dolby Atmos experience was a big letdown and he would rather have watched it in digital IMAX. So there you go. So thank you for listening to this review of Star Wars The Last Jedi, everybody. This has been Second Opinion, our production of The Nexus TV. Find us on Twitter at The Nexus TV or send us an email at thenexustv at gmail.com if you have any feedback about this episode or if you would like to come on as a guest to review something for us or if you have like suggestions for movies or TV shows or gadgets that we can review. Mike, where can people find you on the internet? They can uh, find me at the Future Jam on Twitter and Facebook. And uh, I do the Future Jam podcast. It's in hiatus right now, but we just recorded an episode on Bitcoin. And that's going to be out in the new year. So uh, yeah. thanks, for, thanks for having me on, Ian. I, I really had a lot of fun. I don't get a much t- uh, chance to talk movies, really, on yeah. podcasts. So it's, the last time I did that was for Spider-Man, the uh, Homecoming. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And I have been Ian R. Buck. You can find me on Twitter as Ian R. Buck or go to my website, ianrbuck.com, to see links to other stuff that I make. Thanks for listening, everybody. Have a good one. <laughs>